Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us for yet another investor update. I'm your host, Dan Theok, Senior Vice President of Investment Banking. Joining me is my co-host and investment advisor, Brandon Thomas. It's great to see you, Brandon. How are you doing? I'm good, Dan. Great to be here. I'm looking forward to this episode today and uh, talking about Alaska Manufacturing and, and JP. So let's get into it. Okay, I look forward to it. Brandon is a serious regular here, so I'm excited to hear what he'll be sharing with us today. So be sure to stick around until the end of the program for our special segment where he'll be sharing with you some crucial investment advice. Before we get into that, we'll be sharing our presentations on Lasco Manufacturing Limited and Jamaica Producers Group Limited. And we serve up valuable content like this to you every week on a platter. So don't forget to subscribe to and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our channel. Before we get started, we do remind you that if you're looking to expand on your very first portfolio or embark on your first investment journey, Mayberry can place you on track to financial freedom. So be sure to follow us on social media and turn on our post and story notifications to learn more. By now, most viewers are aware that we go above and beyond to keep you informed on some of the most prominent companies in the private sector here in Jamaica. So without further ado, let's get into Lasco Manufacturing Limited and Jamaica Producers Group Limited. Brandon, take it away. All right, then. Thanks again. Uh, so Lasco Manufacturing, uh, you know, as the name suggests, is the manufacturing arm of the Lasco Group. And uh, let's get right into the numbers uh, as to what they produced last year. For the for the year ended uh, March 2022, so they produced revenues of 9.48 billion, which is up 15 percent over the previous previous year of 8.2 billion. Uh, you know we see where operating profit was up to 2.2 billion. You know that's up 22 percent, and their net profit was 1.71 billion, uh, which was up 24 uh, percent. And Lasco Manufacturing has been showing a lot of growth in in, in recent years. Last year, year 2021, their net profit was up 40% over the previous year of 2020. So this is a company that is growing uh, in recent years. Uh, they have invested over $250 million, you know, in their, in their powder uh, manufacturing facility and really expanded that so they can meet demand. Uh, we can expect really big things from Lasco moving forward. Now, in terms of their current uh, PE, you know, they're currently trading at around 12.49 times which, you know, it is still technically listed on the junior market, but it's really a main market company at, at, at this point. Uh, at, at, but in any case, junior market or main market then is still undervalued. And, you know, Alaska has a lot of room for growth um, with, with even in th that share price. Um, moving to the next slide, we see where the, the quarterly movements and we see how, you know, in the, 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 even during COVID, how, you know, they have grown significantly and have kept up their, their revenues and their profits during this quarter. I will see where in the in, in this latest quarter of March 2022, um, this is a, a what seems to be their largest ever quarter. Uh, it's 522 million. So you know once again it bodes well with the story that Lasco is on the path to growth. And we see where management spoke to that this was a year of, of many challenges um, as in addition to, to that continues to impact the COVID-19 pandemic. There were pressures uh, from the disruption of global supply chain, dramatic shipping and logistic cost increases, and significant materials and energy cost inflation. You know, last time also noted that in collaboration with our distributor, we ramped up our spending digital marketing for more effective and efficient consumer communication and engagement while continuing with the traditional mass media promotions and sponsorships, but with greatly improved efficiencies. The expenses to sale ratio is 13.6%, uh, compared to 16% the year before. So they're much more efficiently run. Uh, they've gotten costs down while increasing revenues and therefore profit is up 24% uh, year over year. To the next slide, we we'll see where the, 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 the price history of this stock, uh, where it traded as high as $5.75, and that was on uh, March 22 of this year. And we see where there's so much more potential you know, I believe Lasca is a, Lasca, Las M is a eight dollar stock, uh, based on the value and where I project them to be towards the end of the year in terms of their quarterly profits and how the PE ratio will work out by then. Um, so it's a stock that I'm I, I have my eye on for sure. The value is there, and management has spoken to the fact that they're looking to add new products to their portfolio, and even have spoken to potential acquisitions. They have about two billion in cash, 
So that can be something that can be accessed. Uh, they also spoke to a, a potential, you know, going to, to, to debt in order to, to facilitate even more expansion to meet demand. So there's a lot of potential for Lasco manufacturing. Uh, Dan, you have any thoughts on, on what we're seeing here? So it's hard to bet against LASM. I mean, with $21 billion in market cap, I agree with you, it's effectively a main market stock. I like to think of the main market average as somewhere about 14, 15 times. So it's clearly trading at about a 15% discount to the main market average. And with the kind of growth in the EPS in the last year, 24%, I agree with you, this stock has great potential to grow. They've got a large war chest of cash. Uh, it's a great business, hard to bet against any of the Lasco companies. Lasso's chin is doing a great job with this business and the others. And so, yeah, I think this is a great stock, and I think it's going to grow by at least 20% this year alone. And if they can keep uh, improving the profitability of the business, they've clearly managed COVID and the challenges very well. So I think post-COVID, uh, you, know, yeah. you can see greater and better things for them. Great brand, great company. Thanks for that, Brandon. Great. Next up, Jamaica Producers Group. And we want to look at the first quarter results for March 2022. And we see where sales have increased by 26%, up to $6.9 billion. And that flows right through to a significant increase in their operating profit at $853 million, up by 12%. And the net profit after tax increasing by 42%, up to $810 million. Similarly, we see really good growth in the earnings per share from $0.23 cents to $0.36, cents, which is up 58%. And we see where the stock is now trading at $22.50, which is a PE of about 12.6 times in a market again, where we said the, I like to think of the main market average as about 15 times. So this is trading at about a 15% discount to the main market. EPS for the quarter was about 36 cents. And, and although that's 58% better than the uh, same time last year, you can see when you look at the 12 month trailing earnings per share of about $1.78, it's not necessarily an exceptional quarter, uh, but I think when we look at the quarterly performance, we'll appreciate why they did $1.78. So trailing earnings of $1.99 billion. Stocks traded at a high of $25, a low of $20. So right now at $22.50, again, I, I sort of intuitively feel like the stock is undervalued by at least 15%. And then when we consider the growth of the business over the last five years, I think that's where it's pretty impressive. Next slide. Again, this sort of shows the quarterly performance of the last two years, and we can see where they had one huge quarter in Q3 2020, and I think that has to do with the quarter in which they sold an interest in um, Sage Logistics. One of the things I like about Jamaica Producers Group is it's it's a big conglomerate that's doing a lot of different things. They're making about 51% of their um, revenues from the food and drinks business. Uh, and about 49 from logistics and services. We've seen a lot of activity in the last two years in particular, whether it's their acquisition in GIST or the continued expansion of the business. You can't read the JP Financials without looking into Kingston Wharfs. You see where they're making about 52% of their revenues uh, today outside of the region from Europe, as a matter of fact, and then roughly 48% from Caribbean and North America. That's how they've described it. So they're doing a little bit of everything, I think, food and drink, manufacturing and distribution of food services, and then the logistics, and then also some land and investment management. So it's a really good conglomerate uh, run by Jeffrey Hall, who's brilliant and, and obviously going to take this business to another level. He's sort of a second generation uh, um, family member running the business, taking on the reins from his dad, Marshall Hall, and of course, with Chairman Charlie Johnston, it's just you can see the quality, quality in the pedigree of the management team over at Jamaica Producers Group. Uh, this business is coming from uh, revenues of about $16 billion five years ago. So they've grown their revenue substantially, about 180% over the last five years. I mean, aided by the acquisitions, of course. And they've also in, uh, grown their EPS substantially from 59 cents, you know, roughly five years ago to $1.78 that we just mentioned. So that's substantial growth in EPS and revenues. Uh, over the last five years. So I do believe they got a lot of cash, great management team in place. I expect that we're going to come back in three, four years' time and see that this business has grown again by another 180 to 200%. So this is a great stock to have in your medium to long-term portfolio. It's really hard to bet against them, really doing great things. They're in a good space. I mean, Jamaica is clearly well-positioned 
uh, to become a leading marine and logistics hub and through their interest in whether it's uh, Kingston Wharfs or Geist or the Miami freight and shipping business that they recently acquired, I think they're just well positioned to take advantage of that area and to grow the terminal and logistics segment of the business from 41% to a more substantial position. So next slide shows sort of the history of the stock. It's traded, you know, relatively flat, I would say, over the last uh, uh, 12 months, um, you know, popping uh, at one point to $30. I, I perhaps think on the backdrop of the large quarter that they had back in Q3 2020, like I said, when they saw some of their interest in sales logistics. But I do think that this is a stock that has good potential for growth. Uh, when you look at the top 10 list, it's something that all of the big pension funds invest in. It's definitely one of the big blue chips. But what I like about them, despite their size, they're sort of still very active out there doing acquisitions. The business is very well diversified in terms of where the revenues are coming from. Like I said, 48% of the revenues coming from Europe. I mean, they're in Dom Rep, where they're now manufacturing uh, the chips. They're they're in Europe. They're in UK. They're in Netherlands. Uh, you know, they're in the Dom Rep. Uh, it's it's a good group. I like the direction that they're going. It's definitely one that I have in my medium to long term portfolio. Brandon, what do you think? Dan, I couldn't have said it better. They're a global conglomerate at this point. Um, and in the last 12 months, you know, they didn't just rest on the laurels. They have been making acquisitions. You alluded to it with GIST, uh, with uh, the Miami uh, Shipping and Freight Company. And, you know, they also had a, a joint venture with Norbrook Equity, where they, they, they purchased, you know, um, Alaska in Dummer, which is an ice and water company. So they're, they're, they're going deeper and deeper into both, you know, their main lines of logistics and food and beverages. And they're continuing to grow both um, segments of their business. Tortuga is expanding. You see a new, uh, I recently traveled through the Mobe Airport and I saw a, a large Tortuga setup. And Tortuga itself um, uh, pivoted during COVID and added, you know, different type of flavors and different, you know, type of cakes to be more attractive to different parts of, you know, North America and Europe. So, you know, the whole group is growing. Uh, um, um, simultaneously, so it, it really speaks, you know, well for JP as a group, and I do believe that, you know, as Dan said, that we'll come back here in a year's time, and we'll see where the stock will be really undervalued if it remains at the at this price. But you know, it's a good buy. Uh, definitely would recommend it. Uh, it's a perfect, you know, for a pension, for a long-term investor, uh, somebody that wants to to invest large sums. This is uh, uh, the perfect stock for you. Then over to you. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate that. Good deal. Okay, next up, Brandon will now bring you some insights from our special investment segment. Back over to you, Brandon. All right, guys. So my investor tip for today is to define your goal. You don't want to go into investments, you know, picking a stock before defining your goal and trying to make a goal to after the fact. You want to define your goal and then pick the stock that will best let you reach to that destination. So after defining your goal, that could look like, you know, you want 20% in a year, you want 100% in three years, whatever that goal is for you, because it's a very personalized thing, talk to us at Mayberry and help us to, to, to devise a strategy and a plan to help you achieve that goal. So folks, define the goal first and don't get into investments prior to doing that. It's one of the most important steps, and that's my investor tip for today. Thank you. Thanks for that, Brandon. And I do think it's important to write down your goals. So, so many clients that I work with, we agree to goals, and I like to document it because they come back six months later, a year later, and, and, and they're changing their story or yeah. changing the objective on you. And so it's, it's really important to, this is not an emotional business. I think you have to stick to the principles. Uh, if you're investing for a three to five year time frame, then that's what you're doing. And I had a lot of clients, for instance, panicked during the COVID period, yeah. sold off their investments on the low when we agreed this is a two to three year journey. And here we are, you know, six months after the heights of the pandemic and most of the market stocks have rebounded. And now they're running back to yeah, yeah. sort of do that. So it's very important to set your goals, write them down and stick to them, working closely with your trusted investment advisor. So thanks for that, Brandon. Definitely. Thank you, Dan.
Very good. Well, to our viewers, it's always a pleasure having you tune in to our weekly investor updates. Your support is greatly appreciated. I'd also like to thank my co-host, Brandon, for his contribution today. Thanks, Dan. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity and looking forward to next week. Great having you here always. Well, folks, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Labor Investments Limited, and be sure to look out for updates on our virtual investor forum on social media. Just hit the bell at the top of our profile to receive all of our notifications. Keep safe, and remember, wise investors, slow and steady wins the race. Take care. Bye-bye.